I spent, uh, I spent my entire career in uh, working in industry research for applying machine learning, developing algorithms that are used um, in practice, that are used in, in products. So what I want to do today and then tomorrow, this is the rough outline of the program. Part one is today, part two is tomorrow morning, is to talk about probabilistic modeling at scale. And I will focus on one thing in particular that's proven to be something that uh, very useful, very powerful for modeling real world problems. Um, it's also proven to be something that very nicely blends between uh, modeling, statistics, and computation on, on real computers on large systems. And so what I focus on is graphical models, something that I discovered for myself about 10 years ago. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why probabilistic models and what kind of big kinds of graphical models there are. Um, then talk about how to do inference in them. Highlight one particular algorithm known as the sum product algorithm, by example, and, and lead that, that uh, discussion into, into a discussion about how to make it practical. Because in practical modeling problems, very few, in very few examples we can use the exact inference, the exact um, solving, of, of the, uh, uh, solving of variables that we're interested in by summing out latent variables. And the last part, Touch a little bit about this. Uh, touch a little bit upon distributed message passing. Although Amr has uh, already done a very, very good job giving giving an insight there, so I will really only touch that. And then tomorrow, I'll talk about four different applications. Um, coming back to one of them that was discussed just uh, just a half an hour ago, which is to learn to play Go with a using a probabilistic model, not so much for the planning, but for the move prediction and the prioritization. Learning to rank gamers on, uh, on Xbox Live. How many people in the room play Xbox Live? <laughs> I think David was looking uh, because of uh, <laughs> some predictions I made yesterday. Jesus, there's a lot of cables here. Um, so, so four people. Um, how many have played Halo? Oh, that's amazing. That's more than people play Xbox Live. Good, so I'll talk about Halo in particular. Um, and then I'll talk about how we can use uh, graphical models and that same algorithm if you wanted to study chess, um, one of the classical board games. And, and the third piece, um, the last piece I want to touch up on, is recommendation systems and so how a graphical models approach can be used for, for recommendation system. So I really only touch up on uh, some of the, I really will only touch up on some of the theory. If you want to dive deeper, I recommend a couple of books from which I've taken some examples, from which I've taken some of the material. One of them is a book by David Barber. Um, this came out about two and a half years ago, um, which is downloadable or available in parts uh, at this address. Um, one is Chris Bishop's book, which is a very broad overview of graphical models, of machine learning in general, but a very good uh, treatment of the sum product algorithm. There's, of course, a wonderful courses on Coursera. And then my uh, personal favorite is Kevin Murphy's book, um, probabilist, machine learning and probabilistic perspective. That one really contains, so if, you, if you're looking for the next level deeper of this presentation, um, that's, a, that's a highly recommended read. Now, why are we, um, why, why am I so interested in probabilistic models? There's three reasons, and the first reason is that um, probability is the calculus of uncertainty. What do I mean by that? What I mean by this is, if we, if we have a machine that has to learn from data, then, then it will undoubtedly make predictions in the future. And those predictions will be uncertain. So if we need to design a system, a machine, a machine system, that must assign a degree of, pl of plausibility to each possible statement about the future, so logical statements A, let's say we don't know what that calculus is, but we make a few axioms. One axiom is that the plausibility is a real number. So it seems pretty... Pretty undoubt, um, seems pretty weak in assumption. The second is that a plausibility is independent of how I phrase my question. So whether I ask a question in the logical statement A, it's gonna rain, or it's gonna, the sun's gonna shining, or I ask the question, the sun is not not shining, which is a double negation, it shouldn't make a difference to the plausibility. And the third one, um, axiom, the third axiom we're gonna make um, is if I have three statements and C is something like the background knowledge, something that's, that I assume to be true, so if the plausibility of a statement A is increasing under growth of knowledge under C prime instead of C, so um, think of something like A, like the um, it's gonna rain, um, and C, everything we know about the weather so far, and C prime gives us extra information, and the plausibility 
of a second statement um, is actually unaffected under the new knowledge C prime. So given we know A is true, and given we know C prime or C is true, the plausibility of B is absolutely not affected. Then what we assume, and that seems reasonable, it's called a monotonicity, is that the plausibility of both A and B cannot go down. It might stay the same, but if A by itself gets more plausible, and B, given A, stays the same, then A and B should at least be as plausible. And if we make these three assumptions, and nowhere did we make an assumption here um, that's quantitative. We just said it's a number. We just said it's, a, it's independent of how we represent logic. And it's mono, uh, monotone in, in the sense that more information gets more plausibility. Then there's only one you can prove, and that's something that uh, was proven in 1944. Um, these are known as the Cox axioms, that under the assumption that P is a continuous function, um, P must be a probability measure. So one of the reasons why I particularly like using probability is that given I'm going to believe in this when I build a machine, a machine system that reasons with uncertainty, I must be using probability to measure the uncertainty. So that's pretty powerful. In that sense, probability is a very good calculus to deal with uncertainty in the future. The second one is um, that it really nicely decouples modeling data and taking actions, making decisions. And in a system, that's kind of the two tasks you have to do. You record data in the past. Um, and when I say data, just to make it simple, this is, whenever I say data, this is what I mean. I mean a table. So a data set for me is a table. And a column in that table, I will call a feature. And the column headers, I will call feature names. And the values in the, in the cells of the table, I call, um, they have different types depending on what they are. So if they're strings, I call it categorical data. If there are numbers, I call it numerical data. If there are two values, I call it binary data. If they're missing, I call it missing data. But when I say data, I really talk about a table. Okay? And what's nice about um, the calculus of, of probability is that it decouples modeling data from decision making in the following sense. There's three tasks. One is taking the past data that we recorded. So really think of a table um, and some uncertainty about the parameters that influence how cell values in these cells are generated. So in, 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 in statistics lingo, we call this a generative model or a sampling distribution. Given the parameters, what's the probability? What's the likelihood? That's the certainty by which we're going to see a value in that table. So the task of inference is the task that we have a system that stores the uncertainty of the parameters. We have data. We get an extra table, CSV file. And we translate that into, we com by computation, into a belief over um, parameters given the data. And all it requires us to do is there's no loss function. There's, all it requires us to do is to have a model of how likely is data generated given the parameters. Okay? So this function is, as a function of data, is known as the sampling distribution, as a function of parameters is known as the likelihood. Now, the second task that we do in any practical system is after we've, we've uh, learned the parameters or anything we could tighten on parameters, um, from data, we're going to use that and together with, think of it as an empty cell, a table that has some empty cells, we're going to fill those empty cells in, we're going to make predictions. And that task is a task which requires us to do integration and summation over the residual uncertainty um, using calculus of probability of the parameters. And only in the last stage, when we actually have built a system that takes an action, like uh, David was saying, moving to the right, moving to the left, um, giving an action to an agent, that's when we have to have a loss function because we need to know, at least instantaneously, but also over a longer planning horizon, how valuable, how rewarding is it for the system if it takes an action in a given state um, where the possible world states are all uh, predicted in this prediction phase. So what's nice about a probabilistic model is it couples these two things. And when I say um, nice compared to, what I compare it to is some approaches where you start with a loss function. So you don't model the data, you model your decision-making process already. Um, thereby um, assuming, first of all, you know the loss function ahead of time, it's not going to change. And secondly, really don't really offering an opportunity to model the, the cells of a table, the, the data that you actually observe. And the third one, which I find is, oops, it's a bit fast, is that it leads to very interpretable models. And um, without telling you yet what this is, this is taken from the second part. When we look at this picture, this is a picture of a graphical, of a, of a probable distribution, so-called graphical model. We can already see some, some of the structure. So we see the top part where some variables get added. Um, that this part, which you might call the item model, where 
another set of variables get added together, then they get multiplied. Um, so there's an additive correction to an input that we call the context model, and eventually we have the, the feedback of the user. So that flow, that graph, is almost like a flow, flow graph of information in a real system. So it really makes the idea of a model from algebra into pictures um, and very interpretable. Now, as I said, we, um, this is a bit uh, going forward. What is a graphical model? In the simplest instance, and that's the way I always think about it, it's just a graphical depiction of a joint probability distribution. So technically, we're going to have round, round, variable, round nodes, circles, that are all our variables, and edges that represent one or another form of relationship between the variables. So there's two types of variables that are important. Actually, in actually, I would say almost three. There's those variables we observe. So when we go back to the table example, it's every cell in the table that actually has a value in it. That we call data. So every cell becomes a, a variable. And then there's variables we have not observed, but we would like to we like the system to learn about. And that's what we call either temper latent variables. So we need them in order to model the values in cells or, or causes variables of interest. And the key question that we try to answer with graphical models, the graphical depiction of them, it started out to be a dependency question. So this is algebra. By the way, in the talk, everything blue will always algebra. Everything, uh, everything black will be pictures. So I think on pictures, but there's always a corresponding algebra. So the dependency question is one where, let's say we have three variables, A, B, C, and we have a joint distribution, um, a conditional joint distribution of two variables, A, B, given C. Then one question we would like to answer by looking at the graph, by looking at the joint probability distribution is, um, is the following factorization valid? Is it true that the joint probability distribution over two variables A and B is actually factorizing in 1 over A and 1 over B conditioned on C? That's a question. There's like a lot of literature that studies, the, that studies properties of the way a graph looks and how that relates to dependency. The one we're more interested in is that of inference or marginalization. What I mean by this is the question of if C was a latent variable, something we introduced in the modeling phase, because it's reasonable to assume that this effect existed, even though it's not one of our interest, we need to get rid of it. So if we have a joint distribution of A, B, C, two variables we're interested in, one that is latent, we introduced in the modeling phase, how can we get rid of it? There's really only one law on probability, which is that we compute the marginal of this variable of this distribution over three variables. And computing the marginal means we'll have to, let's say, C is not of our interest, we need to sum it out. So one other question, central question, that we want to answer with graphical models is what algorithms, how can we efficiently marginalize a joint distribution so as to perform inference, which is the task of summing out all the latent variables we are not interested in. So this there's many types of graphical models. The ones I will mention is three, and then we focus on one of them. The first one, the oldest one, is a Bayesian network. Um, the graphics is the same. We have round nodes as variables, and now we have directed edges between them. So here's one, uh, one graph. So we have three variables, A, B, C, and then we have two edges, one from A pointing to C, one from B pointing to C. And the semantic of that, um, to read it, is that the joint probability distribution over all variables is a product over all individual variables, and a variable only depends on variables that are pointing into it. Okay? So in this case, it depicts a joint distribution over three variables A, B, C, but it really says that A has nothing pointing into it, so it's a probability distribution of A, B has nothing pointing into it, of B, and of C, which has two variables pointing into it, A, a and B. Okay? So it's really, it's a useful uh, visualization for what I call ancestral relationships. So when you know what's the ancestor of a variable in some compute flow. Second kind of uh, graphical model is known as an undirected graphical model. Technically, the edges have no longer got any, any uh, direction. And the semantic of an undirected graphical model is that you look at all the possible cliques um, that are the largest cliques the largest subsets of variables which are connected, fully connected with each other, and the joint distribution over all variables is a product over all clique potentials, over all clique functions. So in this case, we have three variables A, B, C. A and B are connected, B and C are connected. So that means we have two big cliques, one over A, C, one over B, C. And that what, that really, uh, what this picture really depicts is that we're looking at a 
joint probability of ABC, that is the product of two functions, one of function of AC, the potential of AC, one function of BC, and then a normalization. And the normalization is obviously um, summing over all variables, ABC, the joint, uh, the product of these two functions. Okay? So there's a third type, and that type is the one that really is, is very well, it lies somewhere in the middle, and it's very well suited, our graphical model, for computation, for really making it practical, and that's known as a factor graph. So that's a bit younger. Um, so if you, if you trace back the history of factor graph, it actually goes, um, goes almost 40 years back from, uh, from coding theory. Here you have a bipartite graph. You have a graph that has variables, round nodes, and every round node is only connected to square nodes, and square nodes are factors. So every factor has round nodes as neighbors, and every variable has factors as neighbors. Okay? So what it really depicts is just the dependency of the variables on every single factor. So here's an example. So we have a factor graph with three variables and three factors. So we can already see the probability, fun the probability distribution of the three variables A, B, C must be composed of three functions, three um, squares, three black squares. And the first function is a function of A only, the second function is a function of B only, and the third function is a function of A, B, and C. Okay? So a factor graph is really just a depiction of if you have a joint probability distribution, then what is the factorization, what is the set of factors that multiplied together make the value of the function for any value of A, B, C, for any value of the variables? Now, which of the three do you think is most general? meaning being able to model every possible joint distribution. <laughs> the undirected. So the, everything, one thing is clear, every directed graphical model is automatically a factor graph, because that's just the factors. That's the variable it depends on. This variable plus this is the set of variables it depends on. So every directed graphical model is a factor graph. But you said undirected ones. It's actually not the case. Here's an encounter example. So let's go back. So let's say we have three variables, A, B, C, and our joint probability distribution is just one factor. That's easy to represent in a factor graph, just F1 of A, B, C. So the, graph, the Markov network would look like this. So the biggest clique of this graph is A, B, and C because they're jointly connected with each other. So the probability distribution is just a potential function over A, B, C. Now let's look at this factorization. Factorization over A, B. BC and, uh, and AC. So we can represent this in a factor graph, which would be this factor graph. Three variables, and then every edge has a factor. There is a factor of AC, of AB, and BC. But we can't do this in a Markov network. Why? Because if we have a clique potential between A, if AB is a clique, if BC is a clique, and AC is a clique, then ABC must be a clique. Okay, so you can't, so what it really, what's really the case is that an undirected graphical model is too coarse. It, it hides actually factorizations within a clique. It can't represent that. So the more powerful uh, class is actually that of factor graphs. And nicely enough, it's also the class which uh, happens to be the most advantageous when it comes to advantageous when it comes to inference because one thing we cannot do very well in factor graphs, we can't really read off the conditional dependencies. That's not so easy. But we can, from a factor graph, go very, very far, very easily into an inference algorithm, into one that is the most efficient sum, summation algorithm. Um, we can't really do this in the Bayesian network, it's the other way around. For a Bayesian network, you can read off the dependencies very well. There is a, a notion, a set, of, set, a set of notions for looking locally as part of the directed graphical model and determining, think of it as a flow. When you take a conditioning variable, everything that's on the conditioning side, you remove from the graph, and if there's still a way to trace, to walk in that graph from any two variables, then they're, then they're dependent. Um, Markov networks are very powerful when it comes to, um, particularly to local couplings and potentials. So something like images or sound, where you, where you know there's local correlation, temporarily or spatially, and I want to capture that, but there's no generative process, like uh, the retina, which has many sensors, and I know that they're coupled just by their potentials, but I don't really know what generates the image in the perception. So, inference and factor graphs. Um, let's first look at um, base law. How does base law um, fit, fit into this framework of factor graphs? Again, I said the blue is the algebra, the, the picture is the, is the way to think about it. So this is base law. 
Um, I omitted the normalization constant. So base law in, in words is if y is data and s is parameters, then the probability of the parameters given the data is a product of two factors. One is a probability of the data given the uh, parameters, and one is the probability of the parameters and the notion of the uncertainty calculus. So in a, in a factor graph, that is the factor graph. So pay, base law just represents this factor graph. And what's interesting about this factor graph is it always has two variables, data and parameters, and always two factors. This is, people refer to this factor as the prior, and people refer to this factor, that's interesting and important to remember, as the likelihood, if you see it as a function of s, and as a sampling distribution, if you see it as a function of y. The difference is, this function is normalized over y, but not normalized over s. So this sums to, it sums to one if I sum over all possible values of y, but it doesn't sum to one if I sum over all possible values of s. Now, what you often do in modeling is, you introduce factorizations to make things simpler. So imagine this is a model, we want to model um, a game, a game outcome. So there's skills involved, s is the skills, me and David have a skill in playing Go. It's a two-player game. So first of all, let's assume that our skills are independent. So that would mean that the joint, the, the, the prior over S is factorizing in a prior over David's skill and a distribution over my skill. So in terms of pictures, that's very easy to do. Just means we have now instead of one variable vector S, we have two, S1, S2. And both of them are connected to the likelihood factor. Um, but we now have two factors, one representing David's prior skill, one representing my prior skill. Now we want to model a forward flow, so let's make it very simple and we say, you know what, um, in order to express the fact that David won a game of Go against me, we need to introduce something like how good was David's performance in this particular game. So we assume that there is a performance variable for David, there's a performance variable for Ralph, and they're, cut, they're obviously um, they have a relationship to their skill, so performance varies, let's say, around their skill. But that's just captured in, in, the, in the structure form of this function p of t given s um, for Ralph and David. Then there is a factor that translates both our performances into the actual difference of performances. And then there is a factor that translates the difference in performances into the actual match outcome. So we went from a simple, very simple model um, that had two factors, two variables, into one that, that already has some structure. What's interesting about this, this graph, I picked it for the following reason. We now have five variables, S1, S2, T1, T2, and D. Um, this one is what I call a clamp variable. After we've seen the data in the past, we know that value. It's not a free variable. It's actually observed. So um, in terms of, is this a free function of Y? No. But, but not all five variables depend on all five factors, of course. There's structure there. S only depends on the prior and the performance factor. And D only depends on the factor that translates to the two Ts. So this structure is very important when it comes to coming up with an efficient algorithm that we want that, that a machine can compute and scale. Um, but what do we need to do now? In order to do Bayesian inference, remember all this up here, everything that is here was one big factor. We kind of just took a magnifying glass and looked into what that factor looks like. We just refined that factor. So we need to get rid of these three variables. So in order to do inference, we simply need to sum out all values of t, all values of d, all the possible performances that, we, that David could have had, that I could have had, and all the possible differences in our performances um, that could have realized. So the computational task, in order to compute the parameters given the data, is one task of summing out these variables. And the question is, how can we do this efficiently? So I took this graph from right now, and I just turned it around by 90 degrees. So it's just the same graph. So let's say, um, as, a, as a work through example, we're interested in the marginal of this, of this um, variable w. So we have five factors again, f1, f2, f3, f4, structure there. And now we want to we wanna get rid of all the variables x, y, z, and v. Okay, so in algebra, we have four factors, uh, sorry, four factors, yes, and we have five variables, four of which we want to sum over. So what we need to perform in order to get the marginal on W is summing out all values of V, X, Y, and Z. Okay? The problem with this approach, imagine these were simply binary variables. And we would do this naively. We'd implement four for loops, that one loops over all values of V, over all values of X, over Y, and Z. If we did that, 
then we would have an exponential number of computations. So if we ever come to 100 or 1,000 variables, we can no longer carry this out. Like There wouldn't be enough time in the known universe to carry out this computation because it's, it's, it's so many nested for loops. It's just uh, A, it's naive, and B, it's, uh, it's, impo it's impossible to compute. But one thing we can see here when you look at this is we can simplify this equation. How can we do that? Well, if we look at W, we see one thing. W is only in the F1 and F2. It's only really part of two of these factors. F3 and F4 don't contain a W. So in terms of, the, uh, in terms of algebra, we can employ one trick here. And that's an important trick. So let me just show you the trick. So right now, we have a big sum of products. Right? We're summing over v, over x, over y, over z. And then there is a product, f1, f2, f3, f4. But if we have something like a times c plus b times c, then there is a known law in algebra to simplify that into a plus b times c. Right? It's pretty standard. What's so amazing about this? Well, count, let's count the number of operations on the left and right. On the left, how many operations do we need to perform? One? How many? Who said four? <laughs> let's count again. <laughs> One operation, two, and then an addition. Three. Okay. How many operations do we have to perform here? Two. So it's a 50%, uh, it's a 30% reduction. Okay. And that seems very little, but if we apply this recursively in a graph, um, it's a huge reduction, okay? And that's the trick we're going to use. So just remember that trick. All we're going to use is we're going from three operations carried out on some computer to two. By not, and the result doesn't change. It's totally unaffected. And why can we do that? The reason we can do that is because in this instance, V, this F1 factor, doesn't depend on y and z, in x, in fact. So we can pull it all the way over here, right? Technically, what we've just done is carrying out this step multiple times. So we went from all the products that contained f1, this is f1, into f1 here, and then summing. So we changed, practically, we changed a sum of products into a product of sums. This was first summing over a product. Now, we're multiplying sums. Okay, that's why the algorithm has this name, sum product algorithm. So observation, whenever you pick a variable in a factor graph, then the marginal, this, the marginal, is the product of all partial summations over variable sets to the left and right, to anything, to any factor that's neighboring to this, to this variable, okay? So F1 is neighboring and F2, and they, have, they can have arbitrary deep trees under them. So if we, if we group together, so this thing here, if you look at this object, algebraically, this is still a function. It's still a function of W. Right? We sum out V. This, we sum out X, Y, Z, so X goes, Y goes, Z goes. Still a function of W. So if we introduce a shorthand notation for function of W, we basically see that... Um, and we call this the message. So this is a message from neighboring F1 to W and from neighboring F2 to W. We see the first law of the sum product, the first rule of the sum product algorithm, which is that the marginal of a variable is the product of all incoming messages from the neighboring factors. Okay? And what's a message? A message is a function of the same variable that results, that comes out of partial summation. Summation, summing out all but that variable. So let's look at what's the structure form of this message. So this message, function of, of W, is again a sum of products. So we're using the same trick again. Why? Because that factor doesn't have all the variables neighboring to it. The only variable that's still neighboring to this factor is X. Y and Z are not involved. So that means I can pull this factor F2, I can pull this all the way out to X. And now I get a product of sums, okay? But I'm, I'm, weighting each of the, I'm weighting each of the factors by this term. So what I see is that in order to um, compute a message from a factor to a variable, 
I only need to sum out all the local variables. So every factor has all the variables it's, it's, uh, it's involving as neighbors. And all I need to do whenever I compute, want to compute the message from a factor to a variable is sum out all the other variables. In this case, only x is the other variables left. So I sum out all values of x, and I weight um, every possible value of x by this partial sum. When we look at this partial sum, what is this? Well, we sum out y, we sum out z, we sum out y, we sum out z. Still a function of x. So let's call this thing a message again. Now, obviously, by structure is a little different. This message is a message from a variable to a factor. Still a, it's still a function of x, but it's structurally a little different. So we've seen the second rule of the, of the sum product algorithm, which is the message from a factor to a variable is summing out all possible values of all other variables by weighting them by the incoming message from all the other variables. And now what's the message from a variable to a factor? That one is easy in that we can see same rule. It's always, we always just recursively apply this one. So we see that the neighboring factor to x is f3 and f4, and f3 only involves y and f4 only involves z, so I can separate the sum of products again into a product of sums. And we already have introduced a shorthand notation for these partial sums because this was just the message from, this was the shorthand notation for the summation from a factor to a variable. Okay, so I put these three things together and that was uh, first published and seen in this generality in 97 and I get the sum product algorithm. That, oh, that's the sum product algorithm. The marginal is a product of all incoming messages. The mar you take a variable, then the marginal um, is actually just summing, um, uh, taking the product of all incoming messages. The message itself sums out all the local variables, t2 to tn, by weighting, weighing them with the particular message from those variables to those factors. And I kind of peel off the tree one by one. So as long as I have a factor graph that's a tree, so I can pick an arbitrary node, I can peel this off. I can compute um, basically all the, I only need to go twice along each edge. I only need to go compute the message from a factor to a variable and variable to a factor. And so after going along each of the edges of this graph twice, I'm done and I've, I've computed now all the marginals at the same time. So that means if I have a graph that has a million variables, then originally I would have had, you know, two to the million kind of summations in here. But if that graph only has two million edges, I'm now having a linear algorithm, an algorithm that takes only two million steps or four million steps to compute, okay? So it's gonna be, what really matters is not how many variables you have, it's how many interactions, but local interactions there are between variables. And that's part of the modeling phase. So the model really drives the complexity of the algorithm. And what, we, what I've shown here is that this update equation is derivable first principle from the distributive law. So all, this is known as the distributive law. So all, all we ever used in the derivation was the property that a product of sums can be turned into a, uh, sorry, a sum of products can be turned into a product of sums. In fact, there is a version of this algorithm where if this is not um, a sum, but this is a max operation, um, then that's true as well. So the max of AC and BC happens to also be the max of uh, let me see da, 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 da. of A plus B and C. Is that right? Now, now I'm getting confused. I'll work that out later. <laughs> okay, so um, so that's very nice. Now, one thing that people do, um, and that's very useful, is if we do this for probability distributions, it makes a lot of sense if we turn the messages into a log format. So if the messages are denoted by m, then lambda um, is simply, it's just, a, it's just a notational convention, it's just uh, the log of the message. Why is that useful? For two reasons. First of all, we see that the first rule translates into summing the log messages. Right? The log marginal of a, of a variable is the sum of the log of the messages, um, and the log of the incoming messages from a variable to a factor is the sum of, mess, of, of log messages from factor to variable. Now, why, why did we do that? Because if our, fam if our messages, which are functions of the variables of interest, are in the exponential family, how many people are familiar with the exponential family? 
great. So if that's the case, then the log of this message means that as a function of, of uh, t, we can basically turn this step and this step into simple additions. Okay, why is that powerful? Because things like a Gaussian distribution, when you want to perform the computation on a computer for this first step, all you really store of the Gaussian is the mean over the variance and one over the variance, precision and precision mean. And then implementing that first step is simply adding those two numbers up for every variable. You store for every variable those two parameters, precision mean and precision, and then you want to work out for every message the marginal. You just sum up those two numbers. It's, it's that simple. It's not even multiplication, it's just summation. And the family is pretty big. I mean, Gaussians are in there, Bernoulli's, binomials, betas, gammas. So it's a very powerful family of, of, uh, of distributions. Now, there's another nice thing, a redundant computation, um, that in practice, if you map this on, on, on computers, it's going to be powerful. For that, let us look at the first and the second update rule. So the first update rule said the marginal of a variable, t, is the product of all incoming messages. So let's look at a picture, what that means. So if we pick a round node, it has neighbors, which are square nodes. These are factors. And the algorithm just says, we just got to multiply them. So we multiply the theta parameters of those messages. So all the product of all three arrows makes the round PT. And the second rule says that the message from that one ver variable T to any neighbor F, so I picked this one, is, just look in pictures, the product of those two. Okay, so the marginal is the product of this arrow and every other arrow pointing in. The outgoing message from that variable to the factor is the product of all these messages coming in. That means that every marginal is always this message. This message is those two arrows multiplied. And if this were 2,000 arrows, that would be the value of this message times the one missing factor, which is this. Yeah, just in pictures again. The marginal is all three together, and the outgoing message from the variable to the factor is all but one multiplied together. The only one missing is sort of the reverse direction. So if I put this in equation, it means that in a factor graph, I can put, pick any variable and any neighboring factor. Any pair of variable neighboring factor has the property that the marginal is the product of the outgoing message and the incoming message from the neighboring factor. So what that means is, if you imagine this is like a central parameter and thousands and millions or millions of data points, data likely, likelihood messages affect that, I don't need to carry out a million multiplications all the time to compute this message. This message is totally redundant. I can always get this message when I need it from a variable to a factor by division. I just divide the marginal by the message. Job done. So in terms of my parameters, if these are Gaussians, it's one subtraction. So rather than doing n minus 1 additions, I can do one subtraction. If I cache, if I store in this whole algorithm, for every, in this graph, for every variable, I store the, the parameters of the exponential family for the marginal. And I store the parameters for every message from a factor to a variable. Then whenever in the update I need the message from the variable to the factor, I just perform the division. Right? I just divide p of t by mf by the message that points from neighboring factor to t. And because in log space, so when we're in an exponential family, this step is a simple subtraction. In fact, two for a Gaussian or one for a, for a binomial. So it's a super efficient step. Okay. There's one more interesting observation. If we go back to Bayes' law. So what was Bayes' law? Bayes' law said that, um, so I'll just change variables a little bit. If we have, if we observed data y and we have a variable t, then um, Bayes' law says that the posterior over t is a product of the prior of t and the likelihood, which is the distribution of the data observed as a function of t. Okay? So if I look at this, what does is, what is the sum product algorithm say? The sum product algorithm says that the marginal of this variable t is the product of this message and this message. The product of the message from factor pt to t and the product, for, uh, the product of the message from factor y given t to t. That's what we just, we just saw. This comes out of the distributive law. So the, so the marginal of t 
is actually the posterior. Okay? It's actually the product of the prior message and the data likelihood message. But in this simple graph, and every base law has this simple graph, we, we know that what's the message from T to this factor? Remember what the message equation was? So the message from T to this factor is the product of all other incoming messages. There's only one incoming message, which is this. So that means that the marginal, or the posterior, is actually the product of the incoming and outgoing message. In other words, message passing is just separating the likelihood and prior as the incoming and outgoing message. So if I look at the data factor, the outgoing message is the information that comes from the data, and the incoming message is the information that comes from the prior. Okay? So in message passing, we call this the outgoing message from T and this the incoming message to T, but they have the same interpretation. And why is that important? It's important because everything would be fine if only there wouldn't be the second update rule. So that if you go back, just a few slides. So all of this looks very clean and beautiful, except if you look at, well, let's do it in the non-log formulation, if you look at this one. So if this, is an, uh, if this is in the exponential family, then this will be in the exponential family. If, this is, if the messages are in the exponential family, this message will be in the exponential family. If all the messages are in the exponential family and I'm summing an arbitrary function here, one that I really wanted to model, let's say a threshold function or complicated functions like products, then this may no longer be in the exponential family because there's no guarantee that I multiply weighted exponential families together and I end up, this is more like a mixture of exponential families, and I end up with a simple Gaussian or a simple gamma or a simple binomial. So the real problem is that the set of, the set of factors for which all these equations are accurate and exact, is known, is limited, it's probably 10 of them, um, and all the models have been extensively studied and worked out. So unfortunately, in reality, if you model real data, you do need to appeal to, um, to factors which are, which are a lot more complex and which have the property that the second the update equation for a message from a factor to a variable would leave you, would kind of catapult you out of the exponential family space and would make the algorithm inefficient. So what's the solution? The solution is actually realizing what we've just been going through in the last two slides. Every marginal is always the product of the outgoing and incoming message. The message coming from the neighboring factor and to the neighboring factor. Okay? And the idea that, um, that someone had, uh, Tom Minka had in, uh, in early 2000 was to approximate, what we're really interested in is the posterior, is, is these marginals here. We're not interested, the messages are just a means to an end. They're just an auxiliary quantity, like a cache, something we compute. But when we, when we want to make decisions, we make decisions on how likely is a value in a cell in a table. So we really want to approximate that marginal, or posterior, as good as possible. So what all, the idea was to say, well, what if we make the message, uh, if we approximate that marginal as good as possible? So we have the... We pick the, we have an approximate message coming from the, from the prior. Huh? The message that comes from the variable was always the prior. Um, and now we are using the real, the actual message, the actual function that we used in the modeling process. We multiply those one together for, we pick an arbitrary pair of factor and variable and find the closest approximation of the distribution to this true distribution. This gives us a approximate posterior and then the approximate message from the factor to the variable we can get by division again because every marginal is the product of the outgoing and incoming message. So here's it in pictures. So imagine we have a wonderful Gaussian as the prior, as the message that comes from a variable to a factor, right? So it's a, it's a blue curve and our data factor is a threshold function. In fact, the example I was using before has exactly that property. The difference between my skill, um, what the system thinks of my skill and David's skill, is a difference of Gaussians. If we assume we have a Gaussian belief over both our skills, the difference of two Gaussians is a Gaussian. So it's a wonderful blue curve. Now David won the game. So the only plausible, the data, the only plausible performance differences that are supported by data is all the performance differences which are positive, because David won, not I. So that's this, the, the data is this function. So if we carry out the message passing, that means we multiply this function of t and this function of t together, 
we get this thing that doesn't, it only resembles a Gaussian somewhat. That's not really a Gaussian anymore. It's a Gaussian where we chopped off due to the nature of this function, we chopped off the left side. And the idea of approximate message passing is to say, well, pick a distance function. We find the closest possible Gaussian to this, to this beast. Um, so let me say in this example, we chose one that has the same mean and variance. And once we have that, we remember that this is the message that comes from the data, uh, from the prior, the message, the approximate message from the variable to the factor. This is the best approximation of the posterior that's still a Gaussian, that's still in the exponential family. So it's very easy to work out the best possible approximate message because all we need to do is divide the black curve by the blue curve. And as I said before, the nice thing about exponential family members is that multiplication and division is just addition or subtraction of the, of the um, canonical parameters. So this is actually, in reality, the best approximation. Now, the reason why this sounds a bit counterintuitive is, the, is this red curve a good approximation of this actual red curve? Absolutely not. I mean, this curve is zero, or this curve is one. Um, but is it the best approximation in order to give us the best approximate posterior or marginal? Absolutely. And that's at the essence of the algorithm. The algorithm being, you pick any pair of variable and factor, and then you approximate the marginal, and by division, always refine and update the outgoing message from that factor to that variable. The only question remains, what difference measure should I choose? And people have been looking into um, a, uh, using kobach leibler distance measures, so the true distribution being P, the approximating distribution being Q, one way to understand the kolbach leibler divergence, because now when you go back to the essence of this algorithm, this algorithm is fully defined by what's the distance function between the actual posterior from a single data point and the posterior that still fits in my family, okay? So, very typical one is the kolbach leibler divergence. One way to understand that one is to say that under the true distribution, we're weighting the log ratio of the log odd ratio of the two distributions, so we have a weighted log odd ratio. Um, there's a nice generalization called the alpha divergence. So the alpha divergence is formally given here. If you have a density p, density q, then this is the alpha divergence as defined, and it has the property that d0 is the reverse kolbach leibler it's where the role of q is p and the role of p is q, and d1 is p and q, and it's a continuum of distributions. Now, how can I understand what the value of alpha is? That's best understood in this picture. So if the true distribution is, is this, multi, this bi, bimodal distribution, uh, the blue one is the true one. Now we need to find a Gaussian that fits the blue one as good as possible. There's, two, there's, um, there's the chance that we take the kolbach leibler such that the weighting distribution is the blue one, and we take the kolbach leibler such that the weighting distribution is the approximating one. So alpha zero is the um, weighting distribution becomes the approximate one. And what the, pro the property that that has is it actually jumps on one of the modes. Because every, everywhere where the green curve has, has, has mass, the blue curve has also got mass. But the reverse is not true. There is, there's areas where the, where the approximate distribution has no probability mass, but the blue one would have, okay? So if we choose alpha zero, we get a whole class of algorithms known as variational base um, based on the distance measure in this approximating step. And it has the property that it, it jumps on one of the modes. If you take um, alpha one um, and derive the best possible approximation, we get one that has to have the property that everywhere where the blue one has mass, the red one also has to have some probability mass, which is true for this one. So if this is uh, a Gaussian, it just means that it has to match the mean and variance of the uh, distribution that is, of the true distribution, the blue one. Now, it still doesn't answer where I should use which one. So there is no hard science on when to use which alpha, but there is some intuition I can give. So let's start with a very simple example when the v variational base is better than the, uh, the other is known as EP, um, the EP approximation. Let me call them alpha zero and alpha one. So alpha zero is the one that jumps on modes. Alpha one is the one that captures the entire uncertainty, um, um, but at the expense possibly of not resolving multimodality. So let's look at a very simple factor type. And we're gonna see this factor coming back 
um, the factor being a product factor. So tomorrow, when we talk about recommender system, this factor will come back. We will use this factor. Because the way you use, in, the way you, you kind of um, use this whole calculus in real world problems is you, you, you have this tool set of factors that you compose together to make a model. So let's imagine we have a product factor. What, is, what does I mean by this? I mean that the, the semantic of the function that this, this black square implements is a product of the two incoming, uh, of the two top variables, x and y, with some noise on the z. So this is z. Okay, so the probability of z is a Gaussian with a mean at x times y and some variance. That's the nature of this function. Um, and then let's assume we have some Gaussian prior over x and y. So the example here is we observed two. We have a dependency between the things we don't know, x and y, and what we do know, z, um, that is a product. And now let's look at what the posterior looks like. In fact, what, what, what's the true marginal look like? Well, now I'm going from 1D to 2D messages, so I'll show you contour plots. So the 2D, this is the, this is the incoming message from the prior. It's, it's just a Gaussian. So you're looking at on top of a sort of a Gaussian head. Okay. What does this function look like as a function of x and y? I can click, but what would the function look like? as a function of x and y. So think of, um, think of the, just to, to get a picture for it, imagine this is a very small value. So you observe two. What are the possible values of x and y that explain two when you multiply x and y together? What kind of functional shape over the x, over the x y plane will that be? A hyperbole, right? So that's the functional shape. Okay, so every, x, y value that gets a product that's close to 2 with that standard deviation is a likely combination of x and y. And all that, we're, all that we would be doing, what's the marginal? If this is our data and this is our prior, then the marginal is the product of the likelihood and the prior or the posterior. So we multiply in your, in your, in your, in your mind, multiply this surface, which is sort of a bananas with this, which is sort of a Mexican hat, and you get this distorted bananas. Okay, so this is the contour plot from the top. If you multiply this, I can actually share the R script later um, if you want, if you can see that, uh, recompute this. Okay, so this is the posterior. This is posterior, but we can also say, what is this? This is the true marginal for, for X and Y, given the observed data Z. Now, if we use alpha equals one, if we use an approximation that captures the entire support, that would be this distribution. Okay, this distribution is the best approximation because wherever the black one had mass, the red one has mass. But it's actually a pretty bad one because the mode is at zero. So the most likely, um, uh, the most likely values for X and Y are definitely not gonna result in two. And also one really odd bit so we started with something that was fairly vague for x and y. Now we observed a product of two. So in principle, we should have gotten a little bit more certain what the values of x and y are. But we actually got more uncertain after we've seen data. The only reason we got more uncertain is because of the approximation. Yeah, we approximate with something where the most likely value is no longer a possible explanation of the data. And we got more uncertain than we were without data. So this is a really poor approximation. So what is the approximation looking like if you take alpha one? That one would be jumping on one of the modes. Okay, that's nice in the sense that now the probability mass is the likely, if I look at the mode of that posterior, it's actually explains two. What's the downside of this guy? The downside of this approximation is it got far more certain than it ought to be. Okay? This is so certain that, because it just forgot this bit of the posterior, that the, if I ever use this further and now derive uncertainty of future predictions, I'm gonna be more certain than I really should be because this is also still in the true posterior. But alpha zero resolves the multimodality. And so whenever you, you kind of use them as building blocks and you build a model, um, this, is an, this is the right step to do if you have multimodality in, uh, multimodality in your data. Now here's an example where we wanna go with alpha one. <coughs> 
model is a bit different. Um, probably you've seen this model a number of times in, the, in, the, in, this, in this class. We have a linear predictor. So the data is x, and we observe a y. Um, so imagine this is, just this is just standard regression, where we have Gaussian noise on y with variance beta squared. And we have a linear regressor. So we observe some x, let's say plus 1, minus 1, two, in two dimensions. Um, we have two unknowns, which are the weights. Again, we start with the Gaussian prior over weights. The system doesn't know what the right weights are. But it observed, um, it observed a, a value of y. In this case, a value of uh, 2, I think, I chose. Um, for a given feature vector, x plus or minus 1. So if you, if, you, if you now look at the surface of w1 and w2 for fixed x and fixed y, then it's just, it's just a hyperplane, right? So if we multiply this hyperplane by this Gaussian, you're going to get, yes, a correlated Gaussian, but still a pretty good approximation to a Gaussian. So now if you use alpha 1, uh, then you would capture the full uncertainty. You can capture with a Gaussian. This, this is still an elongated Gaussian. You can capture this and approximate this very well with a the Gaussian. There's no second mode. So whenever you use something like a linear separator or linear predictor, then the product of the data likelihood and the prior is likely not going to end, is, is very likely not going to give you multimodality. In this case, alpha 1 is actually the better approximation because it, it's not too narrow. It really just captures the uncertainty in here. In fact, if we take this example a little forward, so um, in the code that I'm going to share is we have a, a very simple assumption where we have two features. So we have a variable t that we can plot it. And the feature is sinus of 3t and sinus of t times cosine of 6t. OK, and we have a beta of 0.1. So this is our sampling distribution for the data. Um, this is our prior. So if we sample Ws and then multiply the Ws by all the possible, this is t. So every t results in a 2D vector. You see that this is the kind of functions that result from the prior. And if we take one and say to label, to generate labels, um, so then we get we get uh, observations, the crosses. Then with this algorithm, if we simply, do, if we simply derive the, uh, the message equation from a, single, from a single observation y to a single weight w1 and w2, you're actually going to be able to compute the, um, the factorizing, the best factorizing approximation to the posterior. So if you look at the true posterior, that would be the black guy. Okay? It's elongated. But with this simple message passing scheme I described, if you go over this graph, this graph is really just this, this little star, w1 to w2, and you observe the y multiple times, and you, you iterate and refine the messages back and forth, um, you will see that you can actually exactly approximate the, uh, the posterior mean of the elongated Gaussian, but obviously, because you're, factor, you're making a factorizing assumption in the model, over the w's, you're going to be axis aligned. So the variance is a little too big in this direction, a little too big in this direction. But in the model of linear separators and linear predictors, um, that algorithm and that divergence measure is extremely powerful. It actually, resu it actually results, you can prove, in, 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 the best, uh, in the best mean approximation for the posterior. OK, so a few more things about distributed message passing. Um, everything would be fine if, in computation, we can carry out this algorithm um, in a single in a single machine, meaning we can represent each of the variables in RAM, we can represent each of the edges in, in, a, in a sequential computation that we carry out on a computer. Um, unfortunately, we, we, we are now in a world where we have data sources, not everyone, but there are some data sources that are so large that that's simply not possible. Because you look at the Facebook news feed, that's more than 100 billion news stories. So that's 10 to the 11. <coughs> bits of information that someone likes or not likes on a single day. Um, there's over, I think the latest count I, I found this morning was uh, 750 million daily active users. So per day, there's almost a billion people. So if you want something by a billion people, you're looking at, at models that have at least a billion parameters. If you simply have a threshold parameter for each user, so you simply have a model that says, does it cut the threshold? I want to learn that from their clicking and liking pattern. Um, and we have an amount of, of training data. We have a graph 
that if you just represented each of the data nodes, each of the likes, not likes, as a single variable, you would have already 100 billion variables. Um, sorry, 100 billion data factors for a billion variables. Um, social graph is equally, equally bad. Um, you can look at Amazon. One of the big problems we have in Amazon is forecasting. Um, so far more than, you know, a, Far more than 30 million products per day shipped on the peak day last year. Um, there's lots more in the <coughs> lots more in, in inventory. So you need to make a forecast every single day. You're looking at um, way more than 20 million, way more than 20 million variables if you don't even con consider interactions between them. Um, gamer ranking and Xbox Live is, is, is a similarly big scale. Why is this too big? One of the reasons it's too big is that in a single day, these are kind of important numbers to remember. There's roughly 10 to the 5 seconds. So it's exactly 86,400 seconds. Um, but you can only do a limited number of read-write access to memory. So even if you have very, very fast memory, the architecture of a machine doesn't, when you want to sequentially access it, you need to, uh, you can read in parallel, but you cannot write in parallel. So you, you're down to no more than 10 to the 12 write axes to fast memory. And 10 to the 12 comes increasingly close to, um, to the 10 to the 11 amounts of data that you, that you would have if you were to try to process in a, um, all this data in a single machine. And that process would mean you have just about enough time to switch the state once. So let alone doing all these additions and multiplications. So you couldn't even, the other problem is if you'd want to do this everything on a single machine, you can't really go above uh, 10, 10, 8 to 10 terabyte per day on, on pushing data somewhat into the machine. So if you think we can just build bigger computers, somehow you, you ought to get the data into the computer and the computer needs to be able to change its state. These, these ABCs I have here in a the computer, they're just memory cells that you need to change, um, change in value. And the scale that we reached in some of these applications is beyond what a single machine memory and network or disk can read in and change state. So if you look at a very simple model, um, which is we, um, a conditional independence model. So we have little bits. This could be clicks on ads or clicks on likes or customer purchased the product or did not purchase the product or um, clicked on it to purchase the product on Amazon or customer chose to click on that search result when they typed it in Bing, like all these applications. Um, this is the why I is a binary variable. And we observed a lot about who the user is, what's their ID, what's their IP address. We observed about the content, the context, you know, they're coming at this hour of the day from this region in the world. Um, we can also observe what kind of, of, um, what kind of content features, like is this a shoe, is this a book, or is this a story with a picture, and is this a story with a video in it, is this simply text, this is a check-in story. That's all the X, XIs. So if we assume we have a relatively, I'm not saying what it is, but we have a simple model that says given all parameters theta, so this would be the object that has billions of values. By billions, I'm thinking of something like just a threshold, simple threshold per user in Facebook, or a simple threshold per product, per user, per customer in, in Amazon, or in Bing, or in Google. Um, this object has several billion dimensions, but given all the parameters, um, you assume that all the data is factorizing. So you now have 100 billion factors. As an example, running example, let me pick the newsfeed example. So that's 100 billion. And that little guy here, which we assume, make it simple, factorizes, has several billion um, factors as well. Then I can't draw a billion, but I can draw a few. Um, one nice property is that not every observation will depend on every parameter. So in reality, there's like loads of parameters, but every single data item might only depend on a small subset, tens to 20 of them. So think of that um, if for every possible value, in, every, in a cell, because after all, all this data I described is simply rows in this table I had at the beginning. If for every possible value and in every possible column, we have a theta, then still every row of data has only got like 20, 30 columns that it attaches. So it really, the number of outgoing edges from each of these data factors is small, which means if you look at this connectivity graph as a factor graph between the parameters and the data, you're looking at a connectivity pattern where some parameters might be heavily used by, by many data factors, but most of the data, almost all of the data, only really touches sparsely on some of the parameters. 
Now, what is an idea how we can actually deal with message passing? Remember, all we need to do in factor graph inference is compute the outgoing message if you wanted the posterior and then take the product of all incoming messages in order to arrive at the posterior. One way that we could deal with this in order to, if you have so much that it arrives on hundreds or thousands of machines is we start grouping, the, um, start grouping these data factors together with respect to where they arrive. So in reality, something like a, like, like a Google search engine or, or an Amazon search engine or, or Facebook, they're not run on a single computer. You have hundreds or thousands of computers that are dealing with a subset of, their, of the users and subset of the, of the search queries. So the data actually is already widely distributed when it, when it emerges. Um, and so what, one idea that we could translate this into, in, into a factor graph is to say, why don't we group all the factors that are on the same physical computer into the same big factor? And why don't we do the same? So we call, and then we compute the messages um, locally in each of these machines independently. And we do the same for the memory. So in general, we store these things, like when you run this in MATLAB or in R or, or on a single machine, you would just allocate an array for the theaters. But if this is bigger than what fits in a single machine, why don't we allocate sets of machines to store those marginals? Remember earlier when I talked about the efficient number, the efficient, the efficient uh, quantities to store, it was the marginals of the variables, the P of theta, and it was the incoming messages from data um, to the variables and from the prior to the variables. So why don't we have machines that store subsets of the parameters? And if you want to make this idea more formal, <clears throat> and then all we need to do is, um, so we emulate a memory, we are using message passing, now this time literal message passing over a over physical network to compute the message locally here and send them um, send them over to this set of services that emulates memory. So if you want to look at this in algebra, um, if we have 100 billion terms here and several billion here, then the idea that I was just doing in pictures is formally just taking this big product of 100 billion and making clusters, k, cluster, uh, k groups of factors. So this is all the data that resides on a single machine. We just assume this is a single machine and groups of parameters that are stored on, on single machines. So we turn a product that had 100 billion times 10 billion factors into one that now has 1,000 factors. Obviously, this is now a bigger object. Um, and let's say another sets of hundreds of factors for all the groups, blocks of variables. And all of these are stored on independent systems that communicate over a network with each other. So if we did message passing, we kind of have to send messages two ways. First, we have to send messages from the data back to the parameters, the upwards message. Um, that's somewhat easy because the data knows which parameters it changed. So when, when, a, when a machine processes a user ID, it knows which user ID that is. So it knows exactly if there is some mapping service to which machine to send that message to. The message being simply these, these two numbers, mean, precision and precision mean. Um, parameters, we also need to send the, the message from the variable to the factor. And that one is a bit more tricky because that would mean that the service who stores all the parameters would somehow have to remember who are all subscribers for all, the, all, my, all my marginals in order to send the latest version to them. And so one idea to, to avoid that is to say that we have training requests. Um, so we structure our computations into blocks, so these are the factor blocks. In fact, we can assume the typical thing in systems view is to have shards, so logical units that may, several of them may live on the same physical hardware. So these are all the factor blocks, the data factors. These are the prior factor, the marginal factors. Um, and then in the communication protocol, whenever data arrives, compute the message from that factor to that parameter, obviously, there's no guarantee that one, one, such, um, <clears throat> one such factor is not possibly addressing several of the parameters uh, distributed. Send them over to this store. So this might take anything from, anything from 10 to 100 milliseconds if this is globally sent around the globe. Um, but somehow these messages need now to come back to all the 
the updated messages, meaning this message multiplied by, by the prior and all previous messages need to be sent back to, the, um, to all the data shards that are having these parameters um, as well. And one way to do that is to actually make an estimation process in here that says what's the rate of arrival, the rate of change arrival that comes from various sources for incoming messages. And this time I really mean physical messages over network as well as messages in the factor graph sense. How many milliseconds before a parameter keeps changing because a blue arrow hits again from somewhere? So if these parameters send back that expiry time, which is a small object, think of it as like the number of milliseconds between changes, then what, what, these, what these machines can do is they can simply um, use their local clock to, to sort which of the parameters are most likely out of date to request an update, and thereby you're not needing to store this entire connectivity pattern between hundreds of billions of data and tens of billions of parameters anywhere in this graph other than, other than in the expiry time pattern. Okay, um, last, before I, before I finish for today, there is a relation for message passing this way to MapReduce. So MapReduce is the simple computation um, where you assume your data is, is distributed in chunks. Let's say we have three data chunks, y1, y2, y3. Um, and then what we're doing is we're doing the processing in the chunks in the map step. Some computation um, happens independently on y1, y2, and y3. And then in the reduce step, all the, all the, mess, um, all the information that each of them, uh, the keys that each of them computed, gets sent back to the reducer, and the reducer combines the messages. So how can we map this to message passing? Well, we could send the prior message. These red messages are the prior. So we could send the prior messages to the mappers, and then each of the mappers computes locally on their data the best possible posterior. And when you take the posterior and divide it by the prior, you get the outgoing message. So in the reduce step, you store the outgoing messages, send them back. Um, in the reduce step, you multiply the outgoing messages together with the prior, and you should get the posterior in the reducer um, the same way that you did um, in message passing. So vanilla MapReduce is basically a single pass of message passing. In the map phase, you send the message from the variable to the factor, and in the reduce phase, you multiply the messages from the factor to the variables together. There's two caveats. First caveat, um, it doesn't really work with approximate factors because an approximate factor approximates always assuming that the incoming message here is already having all the other information. This message from theta to this factor f1 would be the original prior, this data message, and this data message. If we do this in parallel, we don't have this approximate. We, the approximations are not happening at the best possible place. They're all happening around the prior. The second thing is in the reduce phase, if you do this, um, you need to be able to send the entire parameters over real files over, the, over into a single reducer that combines them. And so the number of parameters you can really manage um, successfully with that is, is constrained by the, by the size of a reducer. Um, the second problem, the first problem is actually one that becomes pretty apparent and uh, people have been, have been working on solutions for that. So let's look at the simple model again, this time make it more concrete, where we have a binary feedback, like a, like a click, non-click. We have some features um, and some parameters. So we take the inner product of parameters to the features, very simple linear model. Um, and if yi is plus one minus one, if the click happened, this is positive. If the click didn't happen, it's negative. This function is the probit function, so it's either when it's very positive, it's very uh, likely to be 100% click, when it's very negative, it's likely to be 0% um, click, and we assume effectorizing prior over the, um, over the parameters. Um, there's one way we could do it. If we don't want to use MapReduce, we will execute this message passing schedule, which means we first send this message, we first compute this message from the prior of theta to theta, then we compute the message from theta to the first factor, well, that's just this copy. Then we incorporate, we compute the message from the data factor to this, uh, to this uh, from data to this factor. So uh, I'll, tomorrow I'll show what that is. And then the second step, we're already using this down, uh, this message here is already the product of the information that comes from the first data item and the prior. And if we do this again, at the third point, 
the incoming message here, this one is actually, oops, wrong key, is actually the product of this message, this message, this message. And let me compare it to true MapReduce. In true MapReduce, we send them out in one go. And then we reduce them in one step. This one is going to be slow because it's one after the other. We can really only compute it in one computer. This one is going to be fast because we can do this in parallel on three machines. Now, if we take a very, very simple model where all our features are highly correlated. In fact, they all have the same value. So we kind of said, you know, we have K feature teams. They need to develop a feature that separates clicks from non-clicks. And they all coming, they don't talk to each other, but they all come back with features that are highly correlated, meaning the, uh, the value of the feature is actually identical. If we only have one feature team, we can compare the convergence of these two schemes. So by convergence, what I simply mean is if we do 100 steps of these updates, so we have y1 to y100, um, in a sequential way, I'm plotting the marginal for p of theta, which is a precision and a precision mean, or mean and variance of this single Gaussian, because we only have one feature. Um, you see that we're homing in, we slowly, it's not, a, it's not a straight line, but what's nice about this space where we have the precision and the precision mean is that we somewhat have a almost, almost linear um, ascent through learning. So the, the message, the, the marginal, the messages are the gradients in here, and the marginal is the blue points. They're converging on that precision. If we do this in parallel, um, and we look at what is, the, what is the marginal if we were to look at the step after we reduce. So in the reduce step, we now multiply each of the messages in. We're getting a lot more certain, like twice as certain as if we are not, um, if we're not doing, if we're doing the correct sequential operation. But more worrying, um, what's, that's, that's, some, that's somewhat worrying. So we go from a precision of 15 to a precision of 45. What's less worrying is that if we look at the mean, so what's the mean? Well, let's look at these two axes. These two axes are the x-axis is mu over sigma squared, and the y-axis is 1 over sigma squared. So if I look at the slope, that's just the mean, huh? delta, delta y by delta x. The mean of these is pretty much the same. So both of them converge to the same mean, but the parallel computing scheme with MapReduce was a lot more certain than it ought to be. Now, we, you obviously, single feature is not enough. Imagine we have 100 features that we're using. So the table had 100 columns, and we, we kind of designed 100 features. Then the situation is pretty bad, because the certainty um, is much less of the parallel. So this is now assuming that we, we computed the messages again in parallel, but the vector had 100 dimensions. Um, the certainty is not as high as it should be, but more worryingly, the slope of the red, which is the parallel one, is completely wrong compared to the slope of this one. In fact, what people have observed, if you apply the, the message passing scheme you saw before between this distributed set of data and distributed set of parameters, um, very naively, simply by assuming these approximations will, very, will, will average out, you observe that, there is, is, that uh, the system is going to diverge a lot because of this effect that the um, approximation quality gets increasingly bad the more disconnected. In this case, they are fully disconnected. The 100 machines are completely disconnected with each other over 100 parameters. Um, therefore, every single dimension diverges too strongly. And then in the next iteration of MapReduce, you would overcompensate on this dimension, and it would start to fluctuate. So the trick that people have been using is basically change the data distribution and use something that's known as dampening. So dampening in the original space would mean that we take a message and we raise it to the alphath power, where alpha is smaller than 1. I think it's easier to understand in the log space. In the log space, remember that a message is nothing more than the little, the, the, the little arrow here, the little direction. So a dot is the prior, the next dot is the posterior, and the message is the ratio between prior and posterior or in log space is the, is the difference, subtraction. So subtraction of this point from this point is what we know as called the gradient. So all we really, what people are doing is they're simply scaling that gradient back. And if you do that, you can actually get back to convergence. So if you take this and you scale back massively, as much as you have mappers, in fact, um, 
you're going to be slower in the, in the convergence, but you're definitely going to converge. And the mean, um, so this is comparing sequential against to parallel, and the mean function is, 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 uh, is slowly conver uh, is, is converging uh, fast as well. And with that, I want to stop for today. Thanks. Yeah. How do you set the, uh, the lambda to So um, the alpha here. Um, so one, one rule that we've been, ex we've been experimenting with this a lot um, over the last, um, last six months. Um, one rule we found that's a safe rule is to actually set alpha to the number of mappers. The, the, the problem with that is it's, it's an extreme amount of dampening. Um, there is some work by, by Alex Smola um, on how actually to set this. Um, one idea to, have, to be able to use a smaller alpha, you can actually see this very nicely in this picture. You probably have noticed um, I like pictures a lot more than, than equations. So um, in this picture, imagine that this block of data factors would only ever talk to this block of parameters. And this block would only ever talk to this block. Then you can update this independent of this, right? So if you, because there's no overlap, like the, these messages, Every, every message you send from here is not going to change the, the incoming messages to here. So one idea to, to be able to not have to dampen as much is to be not randomly place the parameters. So right now this is a random placement, but place the parameters such that the amount of cuts, so what I mean by a cut is, is parameters that are going from one to one, more than one of these groups here is minimized. So it's an, I think I'd say it's an active area, um, but that's one of the ideas to make alpha less aggressive. Uh, I think a random partitioning is, is not going to achieve that. Yeah? You are now adding the multiplicative bias by adding alpha, right, for all the terms? You're scaling the bias. Scaling the bias? You you scale the message. Yeah, scaling the message because you think there's this offset in the... But you, you dampen it. I mean, alpha is less than one. You don't scale it. You, you dampen it down. Uh, you, well, you, it's a scaling. I mean, dampening is, a, is, a, is an inverse scaling, of course, yeah. So, but the trend looks like that the trend of the bias looks like it's more integral than multiplicative. So, would it make sense to keep, not keep a constant value of alpha, but... You know, start the value out and then slowly decrease as you move the trend. And yeah, no, that's a good idea. No, you mean like, um, let's see if I, I get that from the picture. I like it. Uh, I think it makes sense. I, we haven't done it. Um, but uh, I like the idea a lot. So, not apply a constant one. Oh, all these animations. You mean have a massive alpha here, so you don't overshoot, but then start, this is a linear trend. So here, go with a more aggressive, a bigger alpha, in order to not wait that long yeah. to converge. That's a good idea. Yeah. Nice idea. Try it out. I sent, this big system is, is done in Excel as a simulation. I can send you the sheet. Oh. <laughs> I mean, this is a simulation.